Hi everyone, thank you for coming to listen. My name is Claire Bian. I'm one of today's six author readers and have been asked to introduce the session. I'm absolutely delighted that ISPS US has made this time and space available for these readings, which are, by the way, another first for ISPS US. It's, um, we are, this is the first um, readings that have been available in this venue. Um, because we have only one hour, our readings are going to be timed. Each of us will have precisely 10 minutes, and when the timer rings, we will finish the sentence we're reading and pass the microphone to the next reader. Um, and for want of a better plan, we're going in alphabetical order, which means that I'm first. Um, and in a moment, I will start the... My name is Claire Bianne. I'm going to be reading from my memoir, Hearing Voices, Living Fully. Prologue. In the beginning, the symptoms of my illness were quite simple. I heard voices. Sometimes the voices were those of people I knew and loved, and sometimes they were strangers' voices. Usually the voices were friendly and helpful, and sometimes inexplicably knowing. Occasionally they were curious, what is she doing now, they might ask. Although I do not recall hearing voices as a child, I was familiar with the friendly ones. The one I loved best is akin to instinct, to the quiet little voice that sometimes tells me what my heart already knows. During the spring and early summer of 1983, when I was 31, the voices began manifesting themselves in a in a more intrusive, auditory, seemingly external manner. But because I usually heard them only when other people were around, I did not know they were within me. And because most of the time they simply made observations about the real and relatively ordinary things happening in my world, I did not mistrust them. But then they started getting things wrong. When they turned cruel and malicious, I got scared. The voices got worse in August after my husband and I moved from Princeton, New Jersey to New Haven, Connecticut. One October afternoon, I was sitting in the sunny alcove of our Orange Street apartment trying to write. It was a warm day, so the windows were open and I could hear all the noises of the street. I enjoyed them. They made me feel a part of New Haven, a little less alone. Around 3 p.m., I heard the laughing voices of children in the neighborhood. My husband, Bill, and I had been talking about starting a family, so I stopped my work, listened, and fantasized about our future. As soon as the distant, unknown children became aware of me, they turned malevolent, accusing me of being an alcoholic, a madwoman. She sits inside and stares at the wall all day, one child screamed. She's crazy. The boy sounded a little older than the others, though his voice hadn't yet changed. His slightly nasal voice and the way he seemed to savor the word crazy made me cringe. I looked quickly out the window but saw no one. Though the boy was too far for me to see, his words flew loud and clear through my open window. The entire neighborhood had heard him. So unfair, I thought, for I was hard at work on an article about North Haven artist Nancy Sonnenfeld for the New Haven Advocate. I was staring at the wall, but I was staring because I was projecting slides of Mrs. Sonnenfeld's portraits of irises onto the wall and recording my intellectual and emotional response to those pale, ghost-like, and disturbingly beautiful images. Delight in the neighborhood vanished, scared and unhappy, I shut the window, turned on the fan, and went back to my writing. From chapter 19, second breakdown, one year in, The Power of Love. In the spring of 1990, I started getting the grunts. This seemed a direct demonic response to my growing strength, my ability to use laughter to banish my demons and thereby quell my fears. The grunts ranged from a single low throaty controlled growl to a rapid succession of throaty huffy expulsions of air. Many things triggered the grunts. Sometimes I grunted when I tried to suppress a voice or intrusive thought. Other times when I flashed on some distressing incident that I'd tried to put out of my mind. Listening to the news would frequently cause me to grunt. Sometimes I would grunt while alone for seemingly no reason at all, and I'd be mystified as to the cause. Occasionally, I'd learn later that someone had been angry with me. 
When completely alone, the grunts could be loud. In the early days, in the spring of 1990, I grunted audibly once or twice in a public meeting. I was horrified and began looking for ways to stop the grunting. In the middle of one August 1990 night, just a few days before we were to go to the Adirondacks on a family reunion vacation with Bill's family, the grunts were incredibly ferocious, loud, and painful. I was getting hoarse and my chest hurt. I got up, went downstairs, and mentally yelled at the demons to stop making me grunt. I was furious because I saw no reason why I should be so tormented. When the grunts wouldn't stop, in spite of my silent yelling and pleas, I slammed my forearms on the sharp corner of the hall closet, and they abated for a few minutes. When they started again, I bit my right arm really hard. I stopped just short of drawing blood, but the bite left a substantial mark. This time, the grunting stopped. I went on vacation with bruises up and down both forearms and a perfect purple and black impression of my teeth on my right forearm. I was mortified, and even though it was August, tried to wear long sleeves whenever I could. I wondered how I could continue. Medication taken as prescribed, at least as an ongoing regimen, was not an option, for it robbed me of my capacity to feel, to love, to engage fully with the world. One morning before work, I walked out under the 15th floor balcony of my office building and considered the pavement below. The grunting, the cruel voices, the paranoia, the intermittent inability to concentrate at work were becoming too much to bear. I pressed the palms of my hands on the railing, pushed up, and started to swing one leg over. Then I thought about my son, relaxed, and put both feet firmly on the concrete floor again. Paul needed a mother. I couldn't leave him to be brought up by Bill alone. I would dishonor my family. I had promised myself in the months following Jean's suicide that I would never do what she had done because I would never wish to hurt so much those who love me. I was and am of the firm belief that suicide, at least for one so young, is a greater act of violence on the living than on the suicide. I was desperate, but I was not that angry. I opened the door to the hallway and went back to work. The next time I tried the balcony door, it was locked. Someone had seen me. Dr. Allen conjectured that I might have manic depression, and in September 1990, I began taking lithium. I hated lithium at least as much as I had hated Haldol. I found on lithium that take, doing things took even more of an effort. It may have been the dosage. I did manage to take care of Paul's needs. In those days, I had virtually full-time childcare responsibilities because Bill's new job at Discover Magazine required that he commute by train to New York every day, leaving by six in the morning and returning home around eight in the evening. Because I knew I had to, I was able to take Paul to daycare, pick him up after work, feed, bathe, and play with him until it was his bedtime or until Bill got home. I coped. I took care of Paul out of love and an absolute sense of duty and responsibility. It was far more difficult to take care of my own needs. Exhausted by the effort of doing what was necessary to get through the day at work, and then caring for my son, the additional tasks of bathing, washing my hair, and ironing my clothes seemed completely overwhelming. While I was able to force myself to continue taking care of my own needs, it took extraordinary effort, and I imagined a time when I would simply let everything go. The thought filled me with horror, and I complained to Dr. Allen, who agreed to adjust the medication. In time, because I found lithium to be at least as crippling as Haldol, I tapered it back down to nothing. And still I got better, though that took many years. I believe it was my decision, finally, to take responsibility for myself, as well as for my young son, that changed everything. From chapter 26, Understanding the Voices. For years, I referred to my ability to emerge from those two major battles with madness as the thing that happened to me that shook the very foundation of my non-faith. I still don't know precisely where I stand with regard to matters of faith, but I know this for certain. I did not win my battles alone. I had the support of my husband and family, of course. I also had the guidance of an intelligent and compassionate psychiatrist who not only listened to me, but also provided alternative points of view. But there was something else. 
as one who grew up churched but non-believing. I had no capacity to comprehend the force or forces seemingly outside of myself that guided me, teaching me to battle my demons and come to terms with the monsters within and seemingly without. I do know this. I came out of the experience whole, in a sense returning to, or perhaps more accurately finding, my essential self. I believe the person who came out of those breakdowns was, is, largely the person I was destined to become. Before the darkness of depression and inertia gripped me, for one who had always considered church to be a social enterprise, finding faith, learning to consider the possibility of a force outside of myself that is not embodied in another living creature, but that can and does have a profound influence over my life, has been a revelation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marilyn Charles. My book is Psychoanalysis and Literature, The Stories We Live, which I wrote as part of a stand I try to take about the need to try to understand human experience rather than lodging it in the frame of psychopathology. Literature affords an as-if space in which to make contact with psychotic experiences. In the Wind Up Bird Chronicle, for example, Murakami takes us on a bizarre journey as Toru Okada tries to encounter exactly what he most resists, hoping to find his way beyond the impasse in which he finds himself. What initially seems to be an external limit can also be seen as an internal one, as the reader begins to recognize the blindness at the core of Toru Okada's troubles. As in other traumatic narratives, the story is offered in disjunctive fragments that both obscure and reveal the meanings we are seeking. Murakami juxtaposes fantasy and reality such that the reader cannot be entirely certain of where the lines between historical reality, narrative reality, and dream or fantasy might be drawn. In this way, he points to both the profound meanings that can be discovered through our attention to the primary process realms of dreams, fantasy, and free associations, and also the difficulty of coming to grips with whatever feels unassimilable. As the novel opens, we encounter Toru Okada, whose cat and then his wife mysteriously go missing. Toru Okada is besieged by symbols, clues, puzzles, and characters he does not know how to make sense of, and is left to piece together the story of his life from the seemingly random fragments. Notably, in this novel, we are offered segments of history and prehistory such that meanings emerge subtly and precariously over time. Much like the dream, Form becomes substance in a kaleidoscope of characters and settings, spaces and times, through which Toru Akara travels. Ultimately, he is drawn to the darkness of a deep and empty well, the well being a place marked by one character as a site within which meanings might be made. As he sits in the well, he both loses and locates himself, losing the semblance that had covered over the deeper, more subtle, and more various meanings to be discovered. Much as Bion suggests, at times we need to deepen the darkness to discover what we are seeking. For Toru Okada, it is in the, the deep darkness of the well that these more profound meanings can finally come to light. He finds himself assailed by intimations of meanings that remain elusive and inscrutable, much as happens to my patient, Leia. In contrast to the apparent order displayed by Toru Okada at first meeting, however, my first encounter with Leia finds her caught in an impossible and relentless struggle to repair her movements so that she can leave behind the disarray and finally become the person she longs to be. In Leia's world, the dividing line between consensual and idiosyncratic reality is not clear, and her observations range from uncannily acute, as when she describes the denied hostility underlying her mother's good intentions, 
to utterly mad as she describes with amazement how her father was able to project his face onto a movie screen and speak to her from that location. Even now, she is amazed not at the capacity of her mind to produce such an experience, but by her father's uncanny ability to perform such a feat. When anxious, Leia easily becomes derailed, whether by a chance movement that startles or by her internal anxiety at the imminence of possible meanings. During psychological testing, for example, she is asked to detail the blood elements she had used in a particular precept. When asked what made it look like a bug, her demeanor deadens and she responds, not really, um, I don't know, I get overstimulated really easily, I react to people's movements, five, six, seven, eight, I'll say it bluntly because it needs to be said, six and one third, five and a half, 750, 8.6, 4.4, 36 to 52, 16 to 10, kind of split. It's on the second movement and centered. In our sessions, we can be speaking about the most mundane of matters and then veer suddenly into territory inhabited by the magical numbers, colors, and sequences that organize her universe. In that universe, we are accompanied by the cacophony of the voices that may seem to come from benign and helpful gods or may turn mischievous and betray her by pretending, for example, to be the voice of her dead grandmother, eventually betraying themselves through the emptiness and vacuity of their routinized phrases. Although I cannot hear these voices or see the presences that accompany them, Leia is quite certain that I can. They are so as real and present to her as my chair is to me. References to numbers are powerful signs that come up early in our work as she tells me about the behavioral outbursts that threaten her treatment. I call them signs because they are indicators that seem packed with implicit meanings without being decipherable as symbols that can be reliably read much like Toru Okada, there is an intimation of meanings that are inevitably out of reach. Leia says that she has been working very hard to get the movements right, but that people would intrude and derail her efforts, such as one nurse who hit her with a five. When I inquire into the meaning of the five, Leia pulls back as though my question alerts her to some danger looming. Meaning seemed too precarious to withstand such scrutiny. How we handle these disjunctions is crucial to the eventual course of the treatment. Such moments require our absolute presence, unbounded by desire or fear. Inevitably, we will at times fail to catch the moment as it presents itself to us. Most often, however, our patients are gracious and offer other opportunities. As Leia tells me once again about her desire to be able to move properly, she refers to her dance class and the five, six. Suddenly, I have some thread of the meaning of five for her, which I communicate with excitement. Leia brightens and begins to tell me more about the five, linking it also to an open hand that might slap you. Numbers, colors, objects, and events seem so laden with meaning that it is hard for us to explore them together, and yet meaning is everywhere as she moves from association to association, becoming lucid and then retreating into more highly symbolized and abstract speech patterns that have idiosyncratic rather than consensual meanings. At times, she seems better able to let me into her world, whereas at others, my questions seem dangerous, as though they would expose secrets best kept private. Toru Okada becomes confused and disillusioned by the various characters who purport to have answers for him, but who seem also to have their own agendas and he descends into the well to consider meanings from his own perspective. So it is for Leia, who moves away from medication, the realm of doctors, and back toward considering the signs and symbols from her own life, desperately trying to fit them together into a picture that makes sense. 
I try to join her in this effort without enforcing my own point of view, but rather reflecting back to her what I hear from her and also the meanings I have made from my experiences with her. In this way, I hope to help her to build a story in which her symptoms can be seen as reasonable attempts to solve a problem that no one has been able to help her with. If we think of self-development as grounded in and built upon the ability to make meaning from experience, this move toward developing a more cogent and coherent narrative is an essential one. Thank you. football coach, I have kind of a loud voice, <laughs> used to yelling at people. Um, I'm supposed to talk about this book, but um, as I was looking at it, it's kind of boring to read from. <laughs> it's a workbook. So it's really to help um, the counselor and the families and the, and the diagnosed person, quote, uh, help them get started. <clears throat> what I'm going to read, read from is another book back. It's called The Emotional Pain Diagram. And it's actually what really got me going in the direction uh, uh, that I'm here in, in a way and it's a little bio about my life, but what it is is um, it, it actually traces from the violation to the terror to the, all the different feelings that somebody feels inside, leading up to the, to the symptoms and then eventually the diagnosis. So I'm just going to read from a little bit from the start of it <clears throat> and to um, center you in the right place. I actually have a degree in mechanical engineering, uh, went into teaching after that and then uh, decided I wanted to be a, a psychologist. And so I went back to the University of Southern California where I got my teacher's credential and I had a counseling department in there. And, and um, so I just transferred into it. And so that's where I start in this little booklet. <clears throat> to my present surprise, the counseling department was not set up to prepare individuals for counseling in a school setting as much as it was to prepare individuals for private practice. I don't know all the details, but when one professor in, in particular was hired on, <clears throat> he changed the program to better fit students wishing to enter private practice. In any case, the curriculum was perfect for me because that was my ultimate goal. In addition, the program was <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> very intense, as, as, as intense as any of I've ever heard about from individuals who attended other graduate programs. The challenge was not from an academic standpoint, the USC, <clears throat> but from an actual hands-on practicum work. To get through the program, each student had to take a series of five practicum classes, including one in which the students participated as a student instructor. Each class considered, consisted of 10 students, one professor, and one or two student instructors. So the ratio was about three to, three to one. <clears throat> For the first part of the class, each student counseled somebody who had come to the student center seeking help. While you were counseling, several of your fellow classmates and instructors would observe you through a one-way mirror. After the counseling, after counseling two individuals in each class, the whole class would meet together, at which point your counseling sessions would be openly critiqued. The critiquing process for all of us, which at times lasted past midnight, was not abusive, but it could be quite confrontive at times. The department was committed to making sure each future counselor could perform at a doctoral level, <clears throat> which I really appreciated. <clears throat> Excuse me. Consequently, the pass rate for the first time through the first of the five courses was about 30% or three out of 10. The class was graded on either pass or fail, so it didn't affect your grade point average. I failed to pass it the first time, and here is why. I grew up in a family that did not express any feelings other than occasional anger. We were never physically or emotionally abused by our parents, nor did we as siblings physically fight each other, five boys in the family. There was a problem right there, no girls. But we, <clears throat> we would suppress our anger and then explode verbally at times. I actually made it all the way through the first class, counseling class, but received a no pass grade. On my second try through, I made it to the third week, at which at a point that a different instructor told me I needed to drop out and get some counseling. 
Um, so in a sense, I was kicked out of the program because I wasn't ready for it. Uh, after some therapy with an excellent therapist who had graduated from the program, I felt I was ready for my third try. I did not make it through, but just barely. Each, each one was a semester and a half, and they wouldn't allow you to take any more classes until you passed this one at the start. So I'm sitting around here for a year and a half. Uh, yet it was this third class that changed my life, eventually leading to the development of the emotional pain diagram. At the time, I had a lot of personal issues going on in my life, and as before, I suppressed a lot of anger. In the third week of the class, with all 10 students in one room in a circle to critique our individual sessions, the instructor asked me what I was angry about. I told him that I was not angry because I was not aware of any anger. He then had everyone in the class uh, share how they were perceiving me. All nine of them, plus the student instructor, shared that not only was, did I look like I was ready to explode, several of them shared that they were afraid of me. Since I was not aware of any anger, I quickly denied it and thought that they were all wrong. In fact, some degree of paranoia slipped into my thoughts. I began to think that they were lying to me for some reason, perhaps to get me out of the program. Uh, then two days later, while driving in my car, it suddenly dawned on me what I was angry about. At that point, I knew that they were right, <clears throat> and I felt like a fool. And of course, I had to go share this truth to the class. <clears throat> then in another two weeks or so, the same situation occurred in the class through our critiquing session, with me again believing that they were all wrong. <clears throat> this time for sure. But on the way home, while in my car, it again dawned on me what I was wrong, what I, <clears throat> that they were right. So I told myself that at least I was making some progress. This time it didn't take two days to become aware. <clears throat> but as an engineer and as a person who needs control over his life, the blocking out of certain feelings greatly disturbed me. As a consequence, I went to work to, to figure out what I needed to do, and not only to become aware of my feelings, but to correctly understand and manage them. To do so, I spent considerable time attempting to become aware of myself at the deepest level. I also had, probably all of you have gone through the same journey. <clears throat> I also had a couple of clients who were keenly and accurately aware of their feelings. I quizzed them over and over, probably learning more from them than they were learning from me, which is actually true for most of us also. <clears throat> One client in particular, a very bright nine-year-old who had been abused and locked in closets, etc., etc., had to become extremely perceptive to survive, taught me as much as anyone. The following are a few lines of an ongoing dialogue that I had with her while she was in therapy with me and with a female therapist who specializes with children who have been sexually abused. The full account of this dialogue can be found in chapter 11 of my book, Healing Runaway Minds. <clears throat> and uh, Betty is her name. <clears throat> and she starts off by saying, I want to hurt myself. And I ask why. To push down my anger towards my daddy hurt me very bad, sexual abuse. <laughs> What are the feelings you're trying to push down? My anger, hurt, and loneliness. What happens when all the hurt comes up? I feel real alone. So the loneliness comes up too? Yes, then I feel cold inside. Uh, you don't like those feelings? Silly question, huh? No, I try to push them back down. So how do you try to push them back down? I bite myself. How does that push the feelings down? Because I get mad at me. How does anger push down feelings of loneliness? When I'm angry, I don't feel quite as alone. My anger is easier to feel and blocks out the loneliness. Do you feel more important when you're angry? Yes, powering yourself. Probably my first intelligent response to her. <laughs> uh, um, is that because the person who hurt you made you feel worthless? And her response was small. When you're close to death, actually your mother threw a knife at her once and told her she should kill herself after her mother found out that the father was sexually abusing her. Did you feel cut off from everyone? Yes. Why was that so hard? Because nobody in the world would care for me. How, how did that make you feel? Like I was no good. Can you describe the feelings? Cold and really alone and bad, like I wasn't worth anything at all. It was the worst feeling I've ever had. What else were you aware of? How much I really needed somebody. So you absolutely believe that nobody loved you and that's why you tried to kill yourself? Yes. She doesn't use the terms rage and shame specifically, but you will notice them in the dialogue in the form of anger towards herself and the use of such terms as worthless and no good. She also did not use the word terror, but used the term coldness instead. 
a, a couple clients that had been severely abused. Uh, actually, with her, we, we could put your hand on her body when she was sharing, and you could sense that her body temperature was, was going down or lowered. <clears throat> As a result of my personal embarrassment at USC and personal tutoring from a few insightful uh, individuals, mostly ones who had been seriously abused as children, the emotional pain diagram eventually unfolded. In fact, the more I currently correctly understood my feelings and those of others, the more I began to realize a very particular and precise sequence that takes place leading up to a so-called mental illness, etc. <clears throat> with this, uh, <clears throat> thus, with this background, um, well, it's in the, what I want to share it's just allow me to explain the next step. So I actually go in the book and explain all the different steps in there. Anyway, thank you for listening to me. I'm Joan Fazay. I'm going to be reading from Namesake. It's my memoir um, informed by growing up with my mother. I read yesterday on the family panel, so some of you may have heard it. It's a kind of a mosaic of uh, seeking containment and floating on the shimmer. Contained. On TV, in a show about a woman and little girl, they both live in iron lungs. They breathe for them, in and out, up and down. They see what's going on in a mirror above their heads. The man who explains about the iron lungs says they're paralyzed because of polio. This means they can't walk or breathe on their own. The iron lung is their body now. The woman and little girl smile and talk about being able to live at home. The lung sounds like a huge animal. The little girl has a ribbon in her hair and little white bear hanging from the top of her mirror. I wonder about their legs and arms, feet and hands. Is the rest of them warm? Is it lonely inside the lung? My mother says it's wonderful they can have this machine to breathe for them. The way she says it makes me want to just lie down like the girl. motto. My brownie uniform's made from thin brown cotton with short sleeves, buttons down the front, woven brown belt, two pockets on the bodice. My hat's a brown beanie, felt, with a tiny brownie stamped on the front. On Wednesday, I wear my uniform to school. Goodno Pearson's department store has a window display, supplies for Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts the Girl Scout manual with a motto, be prepared, jackknife blades folded into a green handle, corkscrew, can opener, mess kit, pan, bowl, plate, cup, and silverware stacked inside a green bag. Wednesdays we meet in the church basement. Mrs. Needham holds up two fingers in a V, be quiet and pay attention. I sit very still in my brownie uniform, brown shoes, light brown socks. On their brown fold over cuffs, the image of a brownie. I wait for the meeting to begin. I belong where supplies are stacked, then put away with a compass and silver whistle to keep me from getting lost. Care package. Girls in my sorority receive packages from home, usually cookies. Cheryl Joseph's mother sends Nanaimo bars packed tight in a coffee can. Each bar has four layers of chocolate and buttercream. Cheryl shares them. One day I call my mother and ask her to send me cookies. She sounds surprised, then asks what kind. I say peanut butter. When my care package arrives, I open a shallow box, unfold the wax paper. The cookies are broken into small pieces and crumbs. I eat a piece of cookie then empty the rest into the garbage can in the kitchen. Lines on the top of the broken piece where my mother pressed the fork on the cookie dough before she put, in the, uh, put it in the oven to bake. Episode.
on a mattress, on mattress ticking in a pale yellow nightgown, three days, will not move, nothing moves. On the floor, cuckoo clocks tell time. High noon, the river rises. What's the full moon doing up there like a bad balloon? August, riptides, undercurrents sweep us away. I'm 32, my mother's 56. I drive her to the state mental hospital at Stellicum. Shock treatments, Melaril, Thorazine, Haldol. For years, a waxen face that never smiles. She cannot lift a foot or raise her arm. Gone the eyes she turned to the ceiling, counting each hole in the squares. So this was 1975. And my mother was on four different psych wards before this incident. And not to be critical of the profession, but at the time, there really was no help. They, they would talk with her. She was very articulate and kind of eccentric and charming. And the psychiatrists would shake their heads. But then when she couldn't move, I had no choice but to take her to Stellicum. This next vignette came decades later when she was about 80. Artiste, and there's a photograph in Namesake. The doctor in this vignette actually took the photograph. He was a professional photographer. And um, she really, I don't want to say triumphed, I think. Artiste. After she stops her medication, after her cataract surgery, my mother returns to drawing rises at 3 a.m. Soon hundreds of angular girls or women, winsome animals, birds, and flowers appear. She sketches on brown paper bags, paper towels, backs of paper placemats, backs of envelopes on tables and other surfaces. She creates multimedia collages using pastels, watercolors, colored pencils, and crayons. One day she takes the bus to Pioneer Square with her art in a tablecloth. Glenn Allen of the Metropolitan Gallery says, Joan, you are an artist. She will have three shows there. Admirers will sit at her feet at the openings as she speaks of her art, how anyone can do it. They only need to be open. They only need to let it out. She will talk of how her art grew out of her suffering, how it is the child within. One of her sketches will sell for $1,000. She will say a doctor wants to take her photograph. And I'll close with this one. August. We walk across a field, grasses high where insects buzz and sing, russet Indian paintbrush near goldenrod and Queen Anne's lace. Mrs. Cowdery walks slowly toward us. In each hand, she carries an orange. Her white apron falls all the way to the ground. She holds it up to keep from tripping. When we meet in the middle of the field, she hands one orange to me, one to my mother. For many years after, my mother will say, how when I was only three, I said, here comes old Mrs. Cowdery walking across the field in her draggy down apron. My name is Narsimha Pininti, and I'm uh, one of the co-editors of the book uh, called Brief Interventions for Psychosis, a Clinical Compendium. And I'm going to read from this. Essentially, how this came about is because we know that there are a lot of unmet needs in indi for individuals who are psychotic and their treatment. On one hand, we have a push for medications. On the other hand, the psychosocial treatments are relatively neglected. Even where the psychosocial treatments are available, uh, those treatments or <coughs> different psychosocial treatments are in kind of silos. 
So you have the cognitive behavior therapy, psychosis as a group. You have the psychoanalytical group. You have uh, the uh, supported employment. So our idea was to see if we can bring everything together in one particular place and have a vision of how to develop therapy. That's one part of it. The second part is that what is not uh, uh, what is not looked at is the impact of trauma on the individuals with psychosis and all the current treatments we think are not adequate to to address the trauma inertion to psychosis so what we are looking at is having in addition to cognitive behavior therapy, adding mindfulness and, and add together as a yoga mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for treatment of both psychosis as well as trauma. And looks like I'm the only one here with an accent on this panel, so I'm going to read a little bit slower so that you can understand. <clears throat> Psychiatry has reached a crossroads with respect to the way we understand and treat psychotic symptoms. In the past, psychotic symptoms have been mainly studied in clinical situations, and as a result, we have viewed them as pathological entities that more often than not result in psychiatric evaluation and treatment. In addition, individuals with mental illnesses have been portrayed by the media as unpredictable and violent, this leads to the perception in the general public that individuals with psychosis are violent and cannot recover or lead meaningful lives. There are a number of different sources of information which are helping us relook at our individual paradigms. The first source is a strong voice using uh, from the growing influence of people with lived experience who advocate that we look at psychotic symptoms from a much broader perspective than from the current illness prism. Ignored for a very long time, the viewpoint of individuals who experience psychosis is now rightly being increasingly considered in the delivery of mental health services. The second source is the study of psychotic experience in individuals who are normal populations. Okay? And Multiple studies show that up to 15% of the individuals who are quote-unquote normal can develop psychotic symptoms at some point in their life. The third source of information is from spiritual literature, wherein experiences that are pheno phenomenologically similar to psychosis are described in normal populations in and in advanced spiritual practitioners. Okay. There have been attempts to distinguish spiritual from psychotic experiences, but it, it is inconclusive. So what it all means is that there is a need for us to develop services that sub subscribe to a very broad approach towards psychosis and look at, look at psychosis as a human experience, which on one hand can lead to a growth uh, growth experience, or on the other hand, can impair the individual's quality of life and provide opportunities for the individual or the families to access all varieties of treatments, whether it is uh, individual dynamic psychotherapy, cognitive behavior therapy, family interventions, supported em employment, recovery-based interventions, or yoga mindfulness-based interventions, and let the individual and the family choose that particular intervention at that particular point which is effective for them. Moving on to what yoga and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is, yoga and meditation are probably among the most ancient body-mind medicine interventions that shed light not only on the intricate, complex, and dynamic interplay between the body and mind, but also provide us with clear methods about how one can achieve physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. From ancient times, yoga and meditation have, have been advocated not only as techniques, but as rich philosophies, as a way of life, and as a kind of psychosomatic preparation for spiritual eleva elevation and alleviation of all the sufferings of mankind. 
interestingly, health, health whether it is physical and, psych and psychological, is not the goal of yoga and meditation. It is only a byproduct, while the, the goal is the ev e eventual unfolding of the individual f and for them to realize their full potential. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, many concepts in yoga and meditation are rather mystified and add to the existing misconceptions. For example, the terms yoga, meditation, and mindfulness are often used interchangeably. It is important to understand that yoga, meditation, and mindfulness are conceptually three overarching circles and belong to the broad scheme of yoga. Yoga used to be conceptualized in a very holistic, holistic uh, manner, and it, then it is generally understood these days. Okay. In the past, yoga used to be conceptualized as having an eight-step process, of which step six and seven are the two forms of meditation, focused meditation and mindfulness-based meditation. Okay. One of the major objectives of yoga is to acquire deep insights into one's inner self, which not only includes one's abilities and coping, but also requires one to, to uh, look at one's spiritual strength for the well-being. Yoga and meditation interventions can be broadly conceptualized as self-management strategies for gaining insight into the principles of human mind, and that uh, and explain the nature of its attending thoughts, feelings, and various experiences. These insights help one to realize the ways to uh, re-access re the natural and positive states of mind and to experience sustained, calm, and meditative philosophies which are passed down the millennia. Okay. As elaborated in the, in, in the past, uh, all human suffering is based upon a misunderstanding of oneself and one's role in this world. However, through some of these techniques, people are able to better understand who they are, their place in this world, and that ultimately leads to an end to the suffering. The conceptual foundations of yoga mindfulness-based model for treatment of psychosis. Okay. The following concepts about human mind and human experiences from the heart of yoga mindfulness-based interventions. These are succinctly described in the scriptures, uh, yogic mindfulness philosophies like the, like the Yoga Sutras, the primary source textbook of yoga. The five-factor inventory, the balanced view of views on life, and the induction of a detached observation, monitoring, and reappraisal of the psychosis experience uses the, using a staged protocols form the foundations of this particular model. So basically, in this particular model, every human mind and every experience ha is, consists of five different aspects. The five different aspects are the thoughts, the feelings, the perceptions, including internal as well as the external perceptions, okay. the memories that a per person uh, uh, has accumulated over a period of time, and all of them uh, leading to impulses, energy, and behaviors. Any experience, whether it is positive or negative, can be deconstructed into these various forms. And when you are able to understand the negative experiences, understand the origin and the construction of this, that would lead to a better wisdom. It would lead to more empowerment and ultimate recovery. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Self, Psychology, and Psychosis, the development of the self during the intensive psychotherapy of schizophrenia, artwork provided by my wife. 
This book grew out of a symposium I organized in Madrid at ISPS in 2006. David Garfield was one of the discussants, and he and I hit it off and decided at that time to write a book on some of my cases with his psychodynamic analysis, and since he's a Cahusian, his Cahusian perspective as well. Let me read you a little bit of our interplay and uh, see if you like it. This is called Jonathan and the Twinship Transference. Jonathan would have been noticeable in any crowd. His full red beard swept below his knees, his unkempt, knotted hair reached his ankles, snaking through curious, tortured curls as it drooped toward the ground. His eyes were glazed and otherworldly as he sat in my waiting room. He'd been psychotic for nearly 25 years and had not benefited from the various psychiatrists and antipsychotic medications he'd taken over that time. Thus, his family figured they had nothing to lose by dragging him in to see the new psychiatrist they'd heard about through a friend. And dragging him in is what they had to do, for Jonathan's mind was elsewhere. His gaunt, spare frame and seer of visage belied an inner preoccupation with something unseen by the rest of us. When his elder brother tried to get Jonathan to come into the office, Jonathan barely moved. Slowly, with much urging and pulling from his brother, in exhortations from his mother, he stood up. After five minutes, he haltingly walked, slow, hesitating step by slow, hesitating step through the doorway. In another five minutes, he'd moved about eight feet. His brother pulled, but Jonathan became more difficult to move. He was mute and began to show the waxy flexibility psychiatrists associate with catatonia. Catatonia is relatively rare these days, either because patients are usually medicated or our social milieu has changed. Generally speaking, catatonia was presumed to be a state in which patients did not communicate. Psychoanalysts long ago came to the conclusion that even non-communicative patients were communicating something, whether it was anger, an inner preoccupation, avoidance of contact or involvement with hallucinations and delusional figures. I began, what's making it so hard to come into the office? Silence. The glaze look persisted. I'd seen this before and assumed Jonathan was otherwise preoccupied. Gee, Jonathan, your attention appears to be somewhere else. Coming into the office or not doesn't appear to be very high on your list of priorities. He hovered several feet inside the office. His family came in with him, closed the door, and sat down. Tea, anyone? They demurred. I poured myself a cup of jasmine and sat down. Jonathan still hung there, a thin, bird-like presence. When I wrote up Jonathan initially, I called this chapter Ka, K-A, from the Hindu great bird of origin. And to me, he's always that way, this giant bird. What's going on, Jonathan? Again, nothing. Over the next half hour, Jonathan stood as I tried to get him to talk. He wouldn't respond to direct questions about why it was so hard to sit down or what preoccupied him. He would move forward a step or two into the office, then back to where he started. His eyes had a faraway look. You look really undecided about coming into my office, Jonathan. You move forward, then backward, and you seem focused on something else, something other than here. Again, silence. I turned to the family. How long has he been like this? His brother replied, months. He blew up at his girlfriend and threw a computer. He's been living with us ever since. He hardly eats or drinks and stays by himself. And his hair and beard, they're so long, chimed in his elderly mother. I want him to get a haircut, but he won't. With catatonic schizophrenia staring them in the face, his mother wanted him to get a shave and a haircut. Shades of the 60s. Jonathan. Are you listening to something? Is something telling you what to do? Barber, he blurted out. Barber? What does Barber mean? 
Jonathan said nothing, but in a slow, methodical, otherworldly way sat down. That was all he said for the rest of the session, as he stared into the distance, nodding and shaking his head and muttering unintelligible words to himself. Obviously, we all have a sense of what Barbara meant after the shave and the haircut. What are you saying? Again, nothing. You seem to be saying lots of different things. Are you hearing different things? Are you thinking different things? Private and indecipherable words ensued, along with some more nodding and shaking of his head in response to internal stimuli. For all practical purposes, he'd communicated as much as we could piece together that first session. The family said they could handle him at home. I asked Jonathan if he would take any medicines. He remained mute. The family doubted if he would take anything. He tried a number of antipsychotics before with no beneficial effects. I tossed around the various alternatives, but basically decided that I thought he was too disturbed to go into the hospital. I gave the family an evening number at which they could call me and said, let's meet again tomorrow. Dan gently pulled Jonathan out of his chair and the three of them ever so slowly left for the day. Imagine you were seeing what Dr. Steinman sees. The first thing you notice about Jonathan is his full red beard swept below his knees, his unkempt knotted hair reaching his ankles, snaking through tortured curls. Our temptation is to interpret this amazingly rich visual depiction, but let's rather stay with our own infrastructure of our own visual system. Our eyes take a downward, slow spiral course from head to toe. Heinz Werner, the famous comparative development psychologist, coined the unwieldy term physiognomic perception. He noted that objects are first perceived by their dynamic inner tensions rather than by the objective technical features. Moving forward 60 years to many infant researchers like Tronic, Meltzoff, Gropnik, and the well-known Dan Stern, Upending some of Piaget's most cherished concepts of how perception occurs, these researchers also discovered, as did Werner, that humans have something called cross-modal perception. What does that mean? That means that the rhythm, frequency, intensity, and duration experienced in one sensory mode automatically is understood in all sensory modes. The next day, gaunt and ethereal, Jonathan came in again with his family. His face turned from side to side as he muttered to himself. What's that? I asked about the muttering. Rob, Bob, who's Rob? Who's Bob? Without missing a beat, Jonathan starts in. Bob is my father. He's always been part of my life. Bob is floating around in time. He died a few months ago. Rob is the opposite, someone else who came along after Bob died, Bob without the R. Werner's collaborator, Bernard Kaplan, noted that most developmental stage frameworks focus on structures that undergo progressive differentiation. Kaplan's view was primarily functional. Ooh, goodness. Time is a thief. Time? Tempest Fugit. Were you close to your father? Very close. We used to hike a lot and he'd talk about everything. Did you talk too? Not much. Why are you saying Rob and Bob? They're saying it. I'm just repeating what they're telling me. Who's saying it? People, like who? Bill, Bill Bradley, JFK. People are there. People? Representations, voices of people. Someone said he told me that Bill Bradley because he didn't want someone else, JFK. Okay, I am going to finish, I will finish with that then. That's an indication.